Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. Today's video is centered around the McCann parents, Jerry and Kate, and what they may or may not have done to their daughter, Madeline. Now, on YouTube, telling backstories of true crime incidents is touchy at best, because as soon as you start describing the true crime, then YouTube flags it as inappropriate. So I'm gonna try to describe to you what happened here without giving too many details along the way. Chances are it's probably gonna get demonetized, or all of the ads are gonna go towards some other company because that's just how this goes. So if you would like to be able to support me in making true crime content for you, there's a few ways you can do it. The links in the description are the best ways. You can buy merch if you're in the mood. You can also sign up for a free Audible trial using that link down there. You can cancel it before it charges you, so it's free all the way around, but it still helps me. Or alternatively, if you would like, you can also sign up for my Patreon. I am working on starting live streams over there that will answer a lot of the questions that a lot of you have. But enough of that, let's go ahead and move on into the backstory. So back in April of 2007, the McCann family, which would be the parents and three kids, decided to go on a family trip to Portugal. During that time, Madeline went missing. Now, if you would like to be able to see the full details of the incident itself, I'll link it below in the description so you can read it. There are a lot of people that are suspicious of the McCann parents because of how they act shortly after their child's disappearance. Now, just to be clear, there have been some updates to the case. They think that they may have found the person, but I'm also not so certain about that. But we'll get into that. So this interview was taken 22 days after the disappearance of Madeline. Her parents called for this interview with Sky, and it's odd to say the least. I spent a lot of hours just trying to establish a baseline for the McCann parents, and I was tentatively able to do just that. Something that I'm keeping in mind during all of this is that both of them are doctors, and doctors are often encouraged to be able to mask their emotions, so this could be in part the reason of their subdued nature. Regardless, you'll see this interview, like I said, three weeks after their child has disappeared, and they seem very, very, very subdued. Let's watch. Jerry and Kate, thanks very much indeed for, for talking to us. I'd like to begin by taking you back to the, the events of May the 3rd on that evening. Tell us how you discovered that Madeline had gone. Um, as I think people are aware, um, we were checking regularly on the children. And um, it was during my, one of my checks that I discovered she'd gone. I, mean, I can't really go into any details about that, but I'm sure any parent will realise how that felt. Did the panic set in immediately? Yeah, pretty much. All right, let's talk about Kate here for a second. So her tone in her voice, it sounds very fragile, almost very gentle, maybe tired would be a way of putting it. And all of those sorts of things make sense in the context in which they're given. She's very, very subdued. Like I said, you'll see this from both of them is that they're very subdued in general. There's not a lot of emotional consternation happening. To be fair, nobody really knows how they will react to this sort of situation until they're in it. So since I haven't been in this situation, I can't say, oh, well, they're obviously wrong because I don't know. That could be how I'd react. That could be how you'd react. This could be how they're reacting if their child went missing. So right now, Speaking non-verbally, there's not much to go off of. She's had some expressions as she's going through the recount of how things were playing out that night, but there's no possible signs of deceit in here. There's no nonverbal misalignments or anything along those lines to be able to look out for. I do believe that they did check on their kids regularly. From what she's saying, she's not showing that she's trying to hide anything from that point. Let's keep watching. This is a resort that offers childcare facilities, babysitting facilities. Why then were the three young children left alone in the apartment while you were having a meal? I mean, I think if you know the location here, which you've seen, uh, what we did, uh, I think, and it, we've been reassured by the fact in the thousands of messages from people who have either done exactly the same or said they would have done the same. And for us, it really wasn't very much different to having dinner in your garden and the proximity of the location. 
I think it's fair to say that, you know, the guilt that we feel having not been there at that moment, irrespective of whether we had been in the other bedroom or not, will never leave us. Okay, so from what I'm getting from Jerry's stuff here is that I'm getting a lot of anger tales in there, perhaps a little bit of pain after he says this part here. Who've either done exactly the same or said they would have done the same. And you can see this little micro expression of pain that he flashes. Also, these multiple lip compressions and clenched jaws that he's saying while he's stating this. He's very frustrated. And now I don't know how much exact media attention they've got at this point, but they did call for this interview, which leads me to believe that they should be prepared for important questions like this. Like, why on earth would you leave your kids in a bedroom while going away to drink with a table that I've heard from other reports that their table was louder than uh, some of the other ones? There were more drinks consumed. All in all, it just seems like a fairly bad decision to leave your kids in that sort of situation in a place that you haven't been. But like they said, it's a safe resort. It has been known to be a safe resort, so it's not out of the ordinary. And I'm sure that there are a lot of parents who have done similar things, but not a lot of parents have had their kids taken during this time either. So his frustration at this question already is odd to me. Why would you be frustrated at that so early on when you called for this interview doesn't make sense to me. Let's keep watching. Do you blame yourselves regularly? Certainly the first few days I think the guilt uh, was, was very difficult um, but I think as time goes on um, we feel stronger and we felt very supported from that point of view. I'm actually going to pause it after each of these questions so I can talk about how they respond to him because they're pretty rapid fire, pretty rapidly answered as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, for those of you who are parents, I am not a parent, so I am not going to try to assume what your emotions are towards your kids without any grounds. You would be upset that your kid was gone. If they were taken, you would probably feel guilty for some time, not two days. Not two days. They were upset for two days and felt guilty for two days that this happened. And then after that, they were like, yeah, no, we felt pretty, pretty strong after that. We felt strong after two days. That sends a red flag to me just speaking emotionally. Once again, they're doctors. They have to be able to process and work through their emotions regularly because it's important and critical in their actual day-to-day -day job. So that could be spilling out here. And that's something that I'm keeping in mind. However, I'm also keeping in mind that they are human and that their kid disappeared. While they were drinking with their friends, I would feel horrible guilt as a parent if I were in their shoes. But that's just me trying to speak secondhand. If you're here and you're a parent, please let me know in the comments. Would you be okay after two days? Or would you be frustrated, guilty, scared, ashamed? Should I go on about what happened? Let me know. Is there a lesson here, do you think, to, to other parents? I think that's a very difficult thing to say because if you look at it and we try to rationalise things in our head and ultimately what is done is done and we do continually look forward but we've tried to put it into some sort of perspective for ourselves. We're in a very safe resort. If you think about the millions and millions of British families who go to the Mediterranean each year, really the chances of this happening are in the order of 100 million to one. I think, I think at worst we were naive, um, I mean we're very responsible parents, we love our children very much and I don't think any parent could ever imagine or consider anything like this happening. So with Jerry's body language, once again, a lot of anger is showing up here. Now this is partially because of how his eyebrows actually naturally rest. It could be seen as being angry for people, also it almost looks like he's constantly upset. I've taken that into consideration. What I'm referring to in his frustration signals are a lot of the lip compressions and jaw clenching that happens while he's speaking. It shows up and that's a sign of frustration. If somebody is clenching their jaw and doing a lot of lip compressions as he's doing there, they're frustrated about the situation. He's very defensive about what's going on. Now there's two reasons that this could possibly be. One reason could be is that they're actually innocent. They had nothing that they did wrong besides maybe being a little bit neglectful but nothing beyond that. He's feeling very attacked and he feels that it's unjust. 
that could be the reason. The other reason that he's being so defensive could possibly be because they had something happen or they did something and he doesn't want that pride into, so he's frustrated that it's already getting to that point. On her side of things, if you watch her body language while she's talking about this stuff, she does a lot of eye blocking and no shakes. Now, I've talked about these at length on the channel before and you know how ambiguous these can be and it's really reliant on the context of the situation. While she's shaking her head no, this could be attached to negative thoughts around the entire thing. Now, I want to also be clear, since there's a lot of you from all over the world on this, this is speaking culturally towards the UK culture and American culture as well. The yes and no's are yeses and no's. Across different cultures, this is different. Across different neurological types, this is different. So in their situation, this seems to make sense in that sense. However, it's also odd that she's describing things that you would assume would be needless to say. We're very good parents. You know, this is very safe. I don't think that anybody could imagine what we're going through. Why, why would you state that? I'm not actually going to go into the verbal analysis of this because somebody else already has. I've linked it below. There is a statement analyst. And what they do is they go in and they'll take statements, be it verbal or written down, and they analyze them. They really do pick them apart and think about the psychology behind them and why things are said, when they're said, how they're said. And he brings up some excellent points. For instance, this analyst believes solidly that the McCann parents had something to do with the disappearance of Madeline. So if you want to watch that, I suggest watching it below. It's like two hours long though, so consider that. But non-verbally speaking, she's doing a lot of no-shakes, a lot of blocking gestures while saying that they're good parents and that nobody can understand what they're going through. This could be negative feelings. This could be a sign of her really not believing what she's saying. Both are plausible. We're going to keep watching and see which one is most plausible. Were you aware of the, the big public debate that went on in the immediate aftermath and were you hurt by that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean no one hurts you as much as the heart that we had. I'm actually going to comment real quick. So to rephrase, in case you didn't understand what the question was, he more or less asked, there was a large spike of controversy around this specific instance and a lot of people are pointing fingers at them and they said, did that hurt your feelings? She hesitates. You would think that the response to that would be, yeah, that hurt our feelings. We didn't do this and they're attacking us for that. So she hesitates and then she looks away. She shakes her head slightly and says, yeah, with a shrug. Speaking non-verbally, that is a clear indicator of an absolute lack of certainty in what she was saying. My question is, why? Why would there be a lack of certainty on if you were hurt by people saying that you did a thing that you didn't do, a very bad thing that you didn't do? And she's like, mm, yeah, really? Really? Yeah? So her nonverbal communication during this instance is odd. His is staying pretty constant all the way through, which I found to be regular. He's very in control of his emotive states and it's very hard to get a read on him. She's been the more telling one nonverbally from what I've seen, but it's time to keep analyzing. But, you know, we've tried to remain very positive in our outlook. And even small levels of criticism make that hard when you're trying to do everything and you have power to get your daughter back. Heavy eye blocking during all of that. He does blink more regularly, Jerry does. However, it just sticks out as odd at these points that he's doing eye blocking so strongly. Why is once again the question. And then you have to see, you have to watch and try to understand why certain things are happening. It's just interesting to me. I know you've been very supportive of the Portuguese police investigation, but is there anything that you feel could have been done better? particularly in those crucial first, first 24 hours when, when Madeline was missing and perhaps it was treated as a, a simple missing child as opposed to an abduction? I think, um, you know, we are not looking at what has been done and I don't think it helps at this stage to look back at what could and couldn't have been done. I think it's fair to say we expected a very British style response that you would expect if you were in a big metropolitan city. But you have to put it in context that we're in a tiny resort. But, you know, that aside, um, we, the times for these lessons to be learned will be after the investigation is finished and not now. You know, it's an ongoing investigation which has huge resources both from Portuguese and the British. They're working very, very closely with lots of expert help. And I know there's hundreds of pieces of information continuing 
to come forward. And I would strongly like to emphasise, we would like anyone who's been in here in the two weeks leading up to the abduction to come forward if they have not already done so and upload their photographs because we want Madeline back and people can still influence that. The police in this situation, if you if you go and read and you go and watch all of these extra deals, I suggest you just go watch the documentary. That'll help you get an understanding of some of it. The police investigation for that first very crucial period, the first 24 to 48 hours is a very important time during a possible child abduction or abduction in any case. That's a very important time. And the police and law enforcement in the area at that time did apparently a not super swell job. So when he dodges that question about being like, we're not looking at the past. We're not interested in the past right now. He's just being polite to the current law enforcement because it really, it, it really wasn't super well done. A lot of people walked all over the crime scene. It was very contaminated. It was very hard to look at and to be able to get any information from poorly handled all the way around poorly handled. So that's part of that reason here. Also during this time, while he's talking about asking people to come forward and bring pictures and do all this stuff, he's doing a lot of, once again, eye blocking and no shaking. However, when he does say he wants his daughter back, he does do a, a, an affirmative head nod as well. So these are some kind of contradicting nonverbal patterns here. There's a couple ways that I could look at this as an analyst and interpret this. Either one, the no shakes before, there's they're just no shakes nothing to really read into them. And the nod is, or perhaps those no shakes told a little bit more than we initially thought. Right now we're getting a pretty good understanding as to where things are going. So hopefully as this interview continues, and it's not very long, hopefully we'll be able to have a decently painted picture. Looking back, I mean, did you see anything suspicious in the days leading up to her abduction? Did you notice anything? Have you been racking your brains to try to, to think whether people might have been watching? We didn't. If we did, we wouldn't tell you because it may be important information, but we didn't, you know. It was such a relaxing. This is a good question. It's a straightforward question. And he asked it largely because you would expect the answer to be yes. You know, my, my child was taken while in my care and they didn't think, they didn't rack their brains trying to think about who or what or why or when or how this could have happened. They just sat there and did nothing. They were just like, ah, oh, you know what? Our kid's gone. Cool. So I'll have another beer, please. Thank you. What? You, you didn't think about it at all? Why? Why? Once again, why? But also during that non-verbally, when he asked that question, both of them looked down. <laughs> both of them are looking down. This is a shame thing. They di divert their eyes. It's really hard to look into somebody's eyes when you're ashamed of something. That's a very common thing is as soon as shame comes in, uh, a look away will happen. And during this time, when he asks a question, which the answer, I'm going to go out on a limb here. The answer should be yes. Their answer should be absolutely yes. Sleepless nights couldn't think of what or why or how. Their body language right now, besides it being extremely subdued, is not really helping them seem innocent. But they're innocent until proven guilty, and I'm gonna continue on through the rest of the video to see if we can kind of collect this mass picture of who they are in relation to this incident. Holiday, and in fact, as a family unit, up until that night, and with the friends we were here, certainly for us, it was as good a holiday as we have had with the children up until that point. Okay. At the very end, he does an extreme mouth shrug and look down. The verbal interpretation of this is, I don't know. It's not appropriate is the biggest thing. This isn't an appropriate response to this question. And it sticks out once again as a red flag non-verbally. You have to keep believing that Madeline is still going to be found alive and well. Absolutely. And do, we do, do, you, do you ever, though, allow yourself to, to drift towards negative thought? I think in the early days we did, and I think that's inevitable. I think any parent who's been through this does that, certainly in the first few days. We don't now. We're actually um, a lot stronger, a lot more hopeful now. And we have to be hopeful. It's what keeps us going and keeps us focused. Okay, Kate does a lot of partial shrugs. This is a sign of insecurity or uncertainty where she's saying we don't now, but we did maybe a little bit earlier on. Once again, I must put myself in their shoes. 
22 days earlier. It hasn't been a month. It's the same month. And they're already moved past the feelings of, is the worst happening? Is this the worst case scenario? They're already moved past that. They're so certain that she'd been taken. We're going to talk some about some of the questions that she didn't answer towards the end of this video. There's not any footage of it because it was part of the initial police investigation that I don't have the footage from, which is unfortunate. And then we'll summarize at the very end. But just odd nonverbal reactions to this. Odd reactions to this in general. We'll see if those continue happening. And what about Sean and Emily? What have you said to them about their big sister? They're really good. I mean, they're at an age really where they're, they're still quite young and... All right. She's acting so nonchalant about it. She's like, yeah, they're really good. She literally does that expression. Yeah, you know, they're really good. They're doing all right. Oh, cool. How are, why are you though? This is my big question. How are you okay? How are you all right? But I've already said that. We're going to keep reading. I guess it hasn't had the same impact on them as if they were a little bit older. They do talk about Madeline. Um, they pick up things and say Madeline. Impact on them? What about impact on you? That's my concern. Impact on you, the parent. You're saying that they're fine. I'm looking at you and you're acting like you're fine. Why? Why would you possibly be fine? How could you possibly be fine? Hmm. Madeline's, you know, uh, and, and that's fine, but they're, they're really good. I think that's, you know, something that, as many people have said to us, that this is a parent's worst nightmare. And it is. It truly is, and it's as bad as you can possibly imagine. But, you know, if all three of the children had been taken... What was all of that? That was a lot of nonverbal action right there in his face. A lot of looking down, deep breath, going... Eh. Is that a response to his worst nightmare, as people are saying, to have your child taken from you? Or is that a response towards his deceit? It's unclear right now, but he wasn't comfortable with that. Non-verbally, that's what it's saying, to look down and have that cringe expression. It's very common. To have that all happen, then he's really not comfortable with that entire aspect of it. And the question, once again, is why? Are you not comfortable with it because it's an uncomfortable situation? Or are you not comfortable with it because it's not true and you want out? We'll see. It could have been even worse than your worst nightmare. And we've got to be strong for them. You know, they're here. Um, they do bring you back to earth. And we cannot, you know, grieve. One, we did grieve, of course we grieve, but ultimately we need to be in control so that we can influence and help in any way possible. Not just Sean and Emily, but the investigation. So that's a fair point on their part. They want to be in control and they're not, maybe they're not allowing themselves to grieve. If this is the case, perhaps they're not allowing themselves to grieve yet, which is possible. They could actually have dissociated from that instance themselves, thrown up walls about it. Perhaps they're still dealing with some psychological shock from the instance, and that could be that emotional detachment from the instance itself. That could be very, very true. So that's something that I'm keeping in mind as I'm reading is that these are all possibilities. There's going to be a lot of possibilities the biggest thing is finding the truth. And that's why, to be very frank, a nonverbal analyst will work hard with other analysts, with other investigators to be able to come to the truth. A nonverbal analyst can't decide the truth themselves. So anything that I say or state here would rely on other people to be able to affirm or deny that statement. So just keep that in mind. So at the end of this, whatever I say, that's just what my opinion is educated on what I've seen. There has to be more than just one person saying this. So don't take this as like, oh, well, this person said it. So obviously it's going to be true. You have to look at the bulk of all the evidence. And from what I've seen so far right now, I still don't have enough to go off of to be able to say, oh, they absolutely did it or they absolutely didn't. That's just something that I want to throw out there for some of you who might be hoping for a guaranteed answer here. To be very frank and unfortunate, it probably won't happen on a YouTube video. And because of them, the day may come when you have to leave here and go back to the UK. I know you've got no plans to do so at the moment, but how do you think you're going to feel if that, that day comes and you have to go to the airport and fly back? I can't think about that, Ian, to be honest. I can't think about going home without Madeline. So. 
interesting. So when she says, I can't do this thing, she's shaking her head no, like you would expect her to do. I won't do this thing. I can't think about doing this thing. I can't, I can't, I can't. No shake, no words, all aligned. This just forces me to keep in mind the fact that earlier when she shook her head no while saying a positive thing, that is a possible nonverbal misalignment. The reason for that isn't certain, but it could absolutely be there in that we've seen her now say something negative and shake her head no as well. I notice you've got um, Madeline's cuddly toy with you as always. Mm. How did that start and, and what comfort does it bring you? Where did it come from? Or? No, how did the idea come to just have it in your hands all the, all the time? Well, it's something that Madeline has with her every night. And if she's upset or not well, then she has Cuddle Cat. And so it provided me with a little bit of comfort. It's something of Madeline close to me. Interesting. So verbally speaking, I know that this is a nonverbal channel and we're supposed to focus on that, and I get that, but verbally speaking, she uses present tense with Madeline, which really does assume that she is still there, she's still alive, she's still able to be found. So that's a good verbal cue for their innocence, is if they're speaking present tense like that. If they if she had said, you know, this is a little piece of Madeline, she used to carry this with her, uh, she she would have that in her bed before past tense sort of things it's this idea the separation of past and present that would show that they might believe that she's actually dead so that sort of situation that's a good verbal cue for their honesty however this is one verbal cue for their honesty against a lot of really suspicious body language so it's just something that i'm keeping in mind instead of being like ha innocent right away so let's keep watching. This is International Missing Children's Day. I mean, I guess Madeline's had more publicity than just about every missing child in the world put together. I'm sure you're very grateful for, for, for that. Why do you think it has provoked such enormous public support, of which I don't think we've ever seen before? I think there's a conglomeration of circumstances that have come together in this situation. The fact that we're on holiday, um, very safe resort, recognised for that. And of course, the, the world has changed in terms of information technology and the speed of response, you know, in terms of the media coming here and us being prepared um, to some extent use that to try and influence the campaign. But above all else, it's touched everyone. Everyone, you don't have to be a parent for this to have a major impact on you. And I think it's also been very very important and some of the things which we did we have done and said which we didn't realize what impact they would have but so many thousands of people are doing small things to help us find Madeline because the worst feeling was helplessness the absolute worst that we had no bearing on finding her but all right so I know that the answer isn't over to the question yet, but there are some important things that I want to talk about. So he's shaking his head a lot during this as well. And it's not really a positive or negative during this time. It's what I refer to as the unbelief shake. And this is common in times of people recollecting or talking about things that are unbelievable. Literally, it's I can't believe it. And that's where the no is coming from. Most of the time, a no shake will match a thought process. So if you see somebody that's doing a no shake, there is a thought process behind it that's causing that to happen. The biggest thing is figuring out what that thought process is. In this instance, with this line of talking that he's doing here, it makes sense that it would be the unbelievable one. It's unbelievable the response that people have had had. This isn't a sign of deceit or honesty or anything. This is just a reflection of psychological processing on the nonverbal communication that's being displayed. So that's what I'm feeling in here. He's not blocking anything. He's not doing anything odd. It's such an interesting art form, reading nonverbal communication and interpreting it correctly. Seeing patterns like this, the only reason that I know that this pattern exists isn't because that there's a book out there that says it. It's because I've seen it on repeat many, many, many times before, the unbelief no shake. There is definitely a learning curve and an art to reading nonverbal communication. There's so many possible interpretations. The biggest thing that sets analysts apart are how accurate they are. So that's where this is here. We're gonna keep watching. This is already a pretty healthy video, right? Pretty healthy. Once you start to do that, then you start to feel a bit better. And I hope we're going to look back at the end of all this and say that we have done everything in our power, but also that other people are helping in so many other ways and they feel that they are part of it. Does it worry you that people might start to lose interest as, as time goes on, the media coverage diminishes inevitably? For me, um, 
we know that the media coverage is not going to last a long time. It's lasted much longer and we have been much, much more successful in driving our message out than we could ever possibly have imagined. Personally, I think it's gone beyond that at the minute and that there is a feeling with many, many people out there that they will not allow this to happen. And we know that, and we pray that it doesn't happen again, but when it does, the speed of the next response and the template we have set will alter it. And there has been so much goodwill and humanity out there that it really has restored that one evil act actually has resulted in so much good. Where do you go from here? There's talk of travelling around Europe. Have you got any firm plans as yet? We haven't got any firm plans. We're likely to travel in a few places in Europe, um, but as yet, no, no definite plans. But you've got no plans to go back to the UK for the foreseeable future? No. I think that everybody has just been incredibly impressed with, with you as a couple and how you've, you've dealt with this. There was a, a period after a week or so where you, you, you looked as if you were almost broken and who could, for, who could uh, not understand that? And then there seemed to be a sort of a strength come from somewhere. Um, is, is that a fair point? Is that what happened and what brought that about? I think that's definitely true, isn't it? Um... Certainly, you know, at the end of that first week, there was so much emotion that we had spent and we actually had a period where we discussed this openly that we felt devoid, completely devoid of emotion. And the analogy that I like to use is a bit like when we were students and you got to your overdraft limit and you'd gone beyond it and there was just nothing left in the tank. Um, I also I think physically and mentally were shattered. Um, but you know, as you gradually get more on an even keel, we started to get back into the black. And we'd also worked tirelessly behind the scenes to put support mechanisms in place, including our legal team the response with the fund, which was really driven by offers rather than us thinking that we needed it. And once these were in place, then it helped us to focus on what we really needed to focus on. All right, so during all of that, there weren't any nonverbal signs of deceit. Once again, there's a lot of head shaking, and it makes sense that that would be in relation to the unbelievableness of the situation rather than any sort of nonverbal misalignment. Along with that, he looks down a lot, but if you notice, Throughout the entire interview, he does look down a lot, and the times that he does look down weren't at any points of possible deceit. There weren't hot points centered around these down looks that could indicate possible shame or eye blocking or anything along those lines. Now, he brings up the idea of this emotional exhaustion that they felt, and that's very true. And in a grieving period, there is that point where you have burned everything. You've literally gone through all of the emotion you can and you're drained. You're completely exhausted. That's a very natural, very normal thing. They could be going through that. The other possibility is that's as long as they could really keep up their intense grief act. And after that, their strength that overcame them was really just how they felt the entire time and they couldn't keep up their act anymore. It's also possible. It's a lot darker picture if you look at it that way. I'm hoping that it's not that. It's honest to goodness, it's terrible to hear when a parent will do something terrible to their child. So I'm hoping that's not the case. We just have to see what we see and try to interpret from there. Well, everyone who's watching, who's been following Madeline's case over the past three weeks, just wishes you all the best. Thanks very much, Jerry. Thanks for Thanks watching. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, this is what I'll say about their body language. It was indeed suspicious. I understand why people are looking at them and being like, what on earth is wrong with these people? And I get that. I get that deeply. The things that I will point out is one, they are doctors. They are trained to maintain their emotions, to be able to think critically and process well during stressful both emotionally stressful and just psychologically stressful in general situations. So that sort of training could be kicking in in this instance. They could just be relying on their training and ability to fall back on that, to dissociate from the bad, to be able to function best. There is that possibility. I personally, just judging from what I've seen, which like I said, I only showed one interview out of hours and hours a footage that I've watched, trying to be able to establish who these people are. I don't think 
that they did it. I just don't. I know that that might not be the most interesting interpretation, but I'm not here to make interesting interpretations. I'm here to say what I see. So I don't think they did it. What I feel like they are guilty of, because they are certainly guilty, but I think what they're guilty of is just some neglectful parenting. I don't think they're the best parents, but not my place to say I'm not a parent. If you're a parent and you looked at this situation, would you do this? Would you go to a country that you haven't been to before and leave your kids in a motel that is close by, but you cannot see inside for multiple hours while you drink, although you are checking on them regularly? Apparently the door was unlocked to the motel and the checks weren't very reliable, to say the least. Now, along with that, there is some evidence that people have found and said were pretty damning towards them. Some reports say that they found blood and the scent of a corpse through a very reliable sniffer dog that had a very good track record for discovering and unearthing similar situations. And they say that the sniffer dog found those remnants of odors in the apartment room or in the hotel room that they had. So that was a big question of mine, but I wasn't able to find enough on that. Along with that, they have found a possible suspect who was a known criminal in this aspect in this arena, and he was nearby, apparently. I haven't been able to find too much on that either. So there are multiple other options as to what could have happened. There are a lot of views. I do suggest you go and watch the statement analysis that I mentioned earlier. It's in the description below. It's a very good point of view. And he, he has some points where it feels like he's reaching, which I understand. But then there are some other points to where he makes some very solid, solid arguments for the parents being guilty. And what his standing is, is that they didn't kill their daughter specifically. He believes that something happened and it was an accident and they're trying to cover it up. And so I mentioned earlier that there were a whole pile of questions that were asked of them that were not answered. And it was asked specifically of Kate and the good questions. I mean, really good, important questions that she chose not to answer. Questions like, how come you immediately knew that it was an abduction? How did you know that your child didn't just leave? There was no answer. There was a question of, how come you immediately ran to tell everybody at the restaurant, leaving your twins in, in the same room that one was just taken from, that one of your kids was just taken from? No answer to that either. And there's a whole long list. There were 48 or 49 questions that she didn't answer. And then there was one that she did answer. And that was, uh, you realize that by not answering these questions, you are inhibiting an investigation, correct? And she's like, I won't answer these if this is the line of the investigation, which could be she's offended that they're questioning her or she's scared that they're questioning her. So from what I see non-verbally, I don't think they did it. I do think that they're not great parents. I would really like to be able to see that first interview, that first one, that first interrogation that I cannot see. But I know that this might not be the, the answer to the question that you were looking for. I know that a lot of you were probably hoping to, to hear me say that they're guilty, but from what I see, I don't think it's true. I think that they were just bad parents. So if you did like this video and you would like to be able to see more, be it true crime, drama, whatever body language related content that you would like to be able to see, let me know in the comments below. That is where I come up with the next ideas are by how many times y'all ask for it. If you ask for it a lot, it's probably gonna happen. Not gonna lie, I like doing what I'm doing regardless of what I'm reading. So I'm just happy to read what you would like to be able to see. If you would like to be able to support me in other ways, like I said, I mentioned the Audible link down below. If you sign up for that and cancel before your trial period is up, it doesn't cost you anything and it still donates to me. I think it's literally Amazon is donating money to me. So <laughs> thank you, Bezos. Appreciate that. And then uh, there's also Patreon and merch as well. So please check those out. Also like the video, hit subscribe if you want to be able to see more. But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys.